So if you take snapshots and move from sand and combine them, very powerful concept. So what happens is you want to patch your server. So they come in on Saturday morning. They used to do this all the time. You take the Windows server down, you back it up to the disk or to tape twice, because I don't trust tape. You dry your patches. So now you're an hour and a half into it. You start buying your patches and you run into a problem. Oops, Microsoft did it to me again. It's probably done it to each one of you all the time. Now I need to go back. So then you get on your knees and you say a prayer to the tape gods. Please restore my server to the way it was this morning. One of these two copies has got to work. And so you restore it. So there's another hour or more lost. So now you're four hours into the project and you haven't accomplished anything. And if you're fortunate, you're back right where you were, which is a very good thing. Patching maintenance is a high risk endeavor. Now, in the storage or network world where you're booting from sand, your C drives out there on the, on, the, on the sand. You come in the morning, down the server, you go to your web browser, you talk to the storage area network array, and say, please take a snapshot of that C drive for me. And maybe that server had a DE and F drive too. Well, let's snapshot those just to be sure uh, in case something really messes up. Apply so the snapshot. Now you're five minutes into the project, you're ready to go. You apply the patches, same thing. After 15 or 20 minutes, maybe you made a mistake, maybe your Microsoft screwed something up, you need to go back. No problem, you shut down the server, go to your web browser, talk to the SAN array, and say, please restore those volumes to the way they were uh, when I started. It takes a couple seconds, you're back up, and now you've got time to try to patch it again and again, or get Microsoft on the phone or whatever. Uh, and chances are you get you the usual case where you don't run into trouble, down, patch, out of there, maybe you're out of there in an hour, uh, versus what you would have been otherwise. So it's a very powerful concept. Uh, my family really enjoyed that. And, uh, sometimes I wish that I wish they did it the old way. So another uh, aspect of storage area networks that's very useful is replication, where you can take those snapshots that you took and send them off to another array, typically of the same manufacturer, to another array, maybe at a remote site. Maybe it's just the other side of your data center or the other side of your building in case you have a flood. But it's, you can snapshot that data and then copy it across. And so if you're snapshotting your volumes every five minutes, it doesn't take long to send the changes from the last five minutes over the wire to the remote site, off-site. And that's a, that's a wonderful thing. People are building entire infrastructures now uh, using server virtualization with storage, snapshots, and replication. And maybe buy new servers for the main site, take the last generation of servers, set them up at the DR site with a storage array hooked up like that. It's a relatively straightforward thing to take a crash, a major outage here, and get back up and running the, the other site. And that's, uh, that's uh, probably these days the number one people that are, are, are doing virtual uh, server virtualization for it for disaster recovery. It makes things simple. Uh, thin provisioning is an uh, exciting new last three, four, five years uh, sort of uh, feature that allows you, typically before a server administrator would come to me and say, I need 500 gigabytes. I'm going to put up a new server and give me a 500 gig drive. Well, I know I'm not well, they're not going to use more than 300 gig. But if I give them 300 gig, they're going to complain. And if I guess wrong, then I've got egg on my face. So I give them 500 gig. But when I created that volume, I clicked the check mark that said, thin provision is fine. And so what happens is they get what they think is 500 gig. And until they write anything on it, it didn't cost me anything on the back end. So when they write 300 gig to it, it only cost me 300 gig on the back end. Oh, very interesting. So before, we used to have servers with lots of islands of unused storage that were bought and paid for that you just can't use. Elbow room, you need, you need some space. Uh, what if, and that, all that storage is out there and it's not shareable. So putting your storage in the sand, now you can share that so you get a much greater percentage of your capacity actually utilized. And now that more expensive sand storage suddenly became a lot less expensive. Multiple rate times. Lots of times you would put a server maybe uh, boot off a pair of drives if you're an exchange server, maybe you have another pair of drives for the logs 
in an array five array for uh, uh, for your database portion of exchange, and that works well. You can do that same thing with most SANs. You get to create, choose uh, the rate type that you want to create, and it will allow you to migrate your rate type. So if you have something that's on a rate five array and you're having a little write performance problems, maybe you're using it differently than you thought we're going to, you just go in and change it over to rate ten and dynamically. On the fly, it will rebuild itself into a rate 10 array, and when it's done, you will have the uh, performance characteristics of rate 10. Of course, it will take up more storage in your array when you do that, but it's nice. You have the, the flexibility live in production to change the performance characteristics of your product. Automated tiered storage. Well, that's something that we've been chasing for 25 years at least. HSM, hierarchical storage management, ILM, information lifecycle management. Been reading about it in the computer world throughout my whole career. Never read where somebody actually has accomplished it, and it's easy to do when it's something, uh, uh, something that is widely utilized. Typically involves manual tagging data. So this volume, that's, you know, we'll tag that as uh, uh, slower storage, and then we put that on slow storage. This volume's uh, very hot, and we'll move that up, and uh, affects the storage. Wouldn't it be nice if you just wrote storage to the array, and the array figured out which blocks were used a lot and put them in the right place. Uh, that, that can actually be done. We've got two uh, two products that do that. Uh, one is coarse-grained and the other is fine-grained. So we'll talk with it about the uh, coarse-grained one first, Ecologic. Um, CX Tech runs Ecologic in its data center. And uh, so with Ecologic, you have an array typically 16 drives. And those drives could be SATA or SAS or now SSD even. Um, but but uh, and you format that array, and Ecologic only has one rate time. So you format array 50 or array 10 or whatever it is. And the way you expand an Ecologic system is you cluster arrays. So you buy another one, you stick it in the cluster, and uh, and if it's the same rate type and same drive type and whatnot, your volumes will automatically restrike themselves across that. But you might want to say you start out with a SATA array. And then you want some high speed storage. So you get uh, another array, you put it in there, maybe it's got 15,000 RPM drives in it. Um, and you plug it in there, it clusters up. And then you can set it up such that your volumes will migrate from SATA storage to SAS, from SAS down to SATA based on their usage statistics. So if you've got a volume that you're beating on really hard, it'll, it'll move up. If there's space for it to move up, it'll move up over time. And then if you stop using it, maybe it was a test, you were doing some sort of performance test on something, and then after a couple weeks you're done using it for a while, it'll slide back down to, lower, to your lower cost, more efficient storage. So that's the uh, course provision. Uh, Compellent, uh, which we also use in our data center, has uh, what they call dynamic block architecture. And Compellent's dynamic block architecture takes a group of blocks creates a page of them, I think it's 64 blocks, something relatively small. And that page has some information, some metadata with it, and it keeps track of how often the blocks in that page are used. It keeps track of the rate type that it's on. It keeps track of the, the tier of drives that it's on. That's interesting. Why would a page have you keep track of the rate type? You mean you can have different rate types within one volume? The answer is yes. 